morning and here are some statistics as of 2020 uh, some 19.3 million cases of cancer were recorded with 10 million people dying from the disease globally now in Ghana especially there were 24,000 cases that were recorded and 15,000 Ghanaians specifically adults and children dying from the disease in 2020 now there's been so many of the types that you have heard the common ones in Ghana uh, in adults male and female are the breast cancer the cervical cancer liver cancer prostate cancer the not hugging lymphoma stomach and uh, colorectal cancers and also in children, you must have heard about the leukemias, the uh, lymphomas, the retinoblastomas, the soft tissue sarcoma, and the neoblastoma, among the many and the most ones in this country. But beyond the statistics are the hospital stories and survivors and relatives of people who succumb to the disease. It can often be a, a very tail and an ending pain, loss and devastation. If you have had or if you know um, somebody who's died from cancer, you can really relate and you can understand. You never really understand it until it's, it ha it's happened to you or it's happened to somebody that you know, uh, a family member, maybe your mother, your sister, your wife, quite difficult. Now this morning, we'll tell you about Mrs. Patience Achina Brintu, wife, mother, daughter, student whose life was prematurely cut off by leukemia. Have you heard about leukemia? Did you even know how it starts? And do you even know the type of leukemia that are, 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 that's, that are considered cancers here uh, globally and even in Ghana? Now, her pain, her struggles and journey with this type of cancer has been carefully detailed in this book by her husband, Dying Many Times, The Struggles of a Cancer Patient. And this is written by Benjamin Achina Brintio. And we've got Benjamin Achina Brintio joining us via Zoom to tell us how it started, the journey, and even how it ended, and why he chose to talk about it in this book. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. The pleasure is mine. Right. So, um, I, 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 you should tell me about uh, Mrs. Patience at Nabrintu. Who was she? Wow. <laughs> Patient, it's your typical unassuming person. She didn't even uh, have a Facebook account during her, her life. She rather would live a very private life. Uh, but she was also a very positive person, somebody who wanted to um, rise to the heights of life. So, for example, at the time of her death, she was a final year student, chemistry student, uh, aiming for first class at the University of uh, Cape Coast. Uh, she uh, she believed in family, so she had just recently married. She uh, for the uh, the last three years, okay. and then she had a, a little baby, uh, Elijah, who was then about one and a half years uh, at the time. She was hoping to make her parents uh, proud because she comes from a very uh, deprived background, and she happened to be the first person who had risen to that level of height in society. So she was hoping that one way or the other, uh, all that had not been possible in her life and also for her family, through her and the aims that she was trying to aim for, she could bring it up. Unfortunately, uh, she wasn't the loud, talking kind of person. So you will not find her meddling in any other thing. So it, it came as a shock, completely uh, surprising to all of us when we realize that she's gotten herself or she's she's been uh, diagnosed of uh, leukemia we started looking at background we started looking at history of the family we started looking at activities but if that patient is with the husband she's in the classroom she's at church and basically those are the places you will find my late wife wow and how did all this start Okay, so I think uh, one evening I had clothes from work, then she has also vacated and uh, came home. So what was happening is that when it's school time, she will go and then we had a residence back in Elmina where she will be with uh, the little baby and then also at school to it. But on vacations, they come home. So she had come for one side vacation during her final year. I closed from work. 
I came home and then she was sitting quietly. I asked her uh, what the problem was because I needed to catch some rest and then return to church. We had a vigil on Fridays. And then she, after serving me my meals, everything, put the baby to bed, everything, she told me that today I've been bleeding heavily. Um, I thought, I knew she was in her menses and I thought that sometimes menses are not re regular. I mean, it can be heavier at certain days than other days. So when she said she's been bleeding heavily that day, I thought it was one of those uh, bleedings during menses. But then, so when I wanted to push it off, she said that uh, despite changing parts, she had also had to wear several clothes and each one of them gets stained. I mean, so you are wearing about three different dresses and all of them are stained in blood. So that got me alarmed. So I told her if we can go to the hospital. She said, okay, let's see up to the next day. But uh, I am not a type who plays with health issues. So that very evening, we went to the hospital. And that intervention, they had to admit her for one week at the Gaimi emergency at the 37 military uh, hospital. So that was the background. And for one week, we were there and we were getting blood transfusions because then after testing uh, the FBC full blood count, they realized that her blood had gone, uh, her HB had gone down considerably from the normal rate of 12 to almost four point something, which wow. is, an emergency situation, nobody should be walking with 4.5, 4 point something HB. So they admitted her and then the processes started. I mean, after a while of trans transfusions, being there for about a week, we were discharged as okay because then the bleeding was no longer coming to come back for review in two weeks. So we, she got, she got, she started improving because the blood had been put in her, and then she felt stronger again. Everything was moving on perfectly. But then, when we came for the review, we realized that the blood had come lower than what took us there at the initial stages, hmm. and that was very frightening to us because if. Uh, in in about two weeks, you've received about five transfusions, that four whole blood and uh, uh, platelets, and you have come this low again. And the surprising thing is that this second episode, we did not see her bleeding as she bled the previous time. Mm -hmm. So it was then that the doctor revealed to us that the bleeding was happening, but this time it wasn't happening through the vagina. It was happening under her skin. So it was then that we put our attention, there were spots on the skin. It's just like somebody, if you are a very fair lady and somebody applies pressure at mm -hmm. any part of your body, you see that there are kind of stains of, of uh, or, or deepened skinned uh, pigments like red. Right. Uh, red right. pigment at that part of the skin that had been spanked. So there was some of these spots on her. It was that that the doctor drew our attention that this is bleeding. Blood is oozing under her skin mm -hmm. and it is not coming through the vagina. Mm -hmm. So we, we needed to engage in uh, some other test to realize exactly what was happening. The first episode, we were not told what the problem was. Okay. So we then... So then the doctor started asking me about the kind of job I do, whether we have children. And I asked him, what has this got to do with anything? Then he said that the phase we are going to is expensive. And for the first time in my life, I had to deal with a test at a gold that cost like a thousand Ghana CDs. And that was like surprising to me. And I thought that is going to be like one off. And he said, we should do two of them. We have the a bone marrow test where a special needle is sunk from the, your, the back of your waist into your bones through your bone marrow yeah. and then a sample is taken and then there is also another test called trephan biopsy <laughs> where they pick a portion of your bone itself and then they they investigate it so the the, the bone marrow can be done at kolebo yes it, that's the only place as of the time I knew. Yes. And then I think it still Cape is. Teaching Hospital. Okay, Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, I think through Professor Ivy he came, they are also able to do it. But the trephine biopsy, where they pick a portion of the bone, Kolebu can pick it for you, but they don't have what it, I don't know as of now, but as of the time we were there, they could not 
interrogate the, the, the bone. So we had to take it to a network uh, a laboratory. Uh, I, I can't immediately recall the lab, but they also even said they have to ship it to their uh, main lab in Delhi, India, yes. where they would wait and then bring their uh, report back to us. Uh, my dear, the, the cost involved in this was, was, was frightening, but Worse was the process involved in taking the samples from her. Um, if the doctor is not careful to pick it at first instance, and then he has to go again, 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 because either the patient is unstable in the course of picking it, or they discover that your blood level is too low, such so that if they pick it, you you and when and tied to the low blood is a component in the blood called platelets. Yeah. So basically your platelets are so low that clotting is not happening and that's why you are bleeding so when they realize that the blood is so low then it means that you are at a uh, it, it's even impossible to even begin the processes uh, with you so when we we pick those samples and then they, they they we have to go back home and then wait for the results mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is that we are people of faith we, we 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 belong to the church of pentecost so we it became a, a period of intense spiritual activities you know right. that kind of thing where you 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 are overwhelmed you have the money to do the scientific part of the job mm -hmm. but it is not guaranteed that it's going to give you results so you have to turn to something which you feel can bring a miracle and that is what we subjected ourselves to and it was very 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 uh harrowing if that's the word we felt uh, i'm not saying that pr praying or fasting is something bad but we were we were compelled to subject ourselves to it because we needed that resource we would normally not have reduce the whole family line to 24 hours of prayer calling a calling b calling this the good news though is that we had some good and uh, positive results when the results came uh, from kolebu we realized that her blood was beginning to rise the platelets were all peaking so we took it to the hospital and then when the doctors reviewed it they said that this is a miracle so we felt that We've gained some kind of positive outcome from the prayers and our our optimism, and then we are making results. So the doctor said that, given the levels that the blood has risen to and the physical examination of the patient, is giving her the go ahead to continue in school. I even asked him if he's not going to give her an excuse duty, but he said that it will be out of ethics to give the patient with this kind of blood statistics and health and everything excuse duty. So she went. Okay. She was going on and she went back to normal routine again until one day she broke down again. About how many days in between the time she went back to her, uh, her normal routine? I will say about a month and two. The first episode was 29th of June 2019, 29th of June 2019, where I said that I came to work to meet her. Okay. So we were with 27 for about a month or so, and then school resumed around uh, August there, uh, there, uh, yeah, there about. Okay. June. So June June was almost ended, so we had some some one month of July and about some days in August. Okay. So. Okay. So, and I so would say between, that we... between this time, she was fine and everything normal. I mean, if you just joined us on Pi Morning today, today on BTH, we're focusing on our cancer, especially because it's the 4th of February. And 4th of February, we create a lot of awareness on the many type of cancers that people die from, both children, female and male, anybody at all who's been dying from a type of cancer that you didn't even know. And today we are talking to Benjamin Achina Brintu, who is a husband of a cancer victim and who's taking time to detail out the harrowing experience 
the costs that have been counting and the miracles that have been holding on to during the period that his late wife uh, was diagnosed of cancer. Now we are telling the story from the perspective of family members. We get to talk to doctors, we get to talk to uh, survivors themselves, but we never get to talk to people who have lived around these victims to know how they feel and also recount their stories. So today, if you just joined us, this is what we are doing. And just a reminder that we are talking to uh, the man who has written this book, Dying Many Times. It's a Benjamin Achina brain too. So please, as we're saying, I wanted to know between June, late June, and the whole of July, and a few days in in a few days in August, how she was feeling. Everything was okay. She didn't look ill, nothing. No, not at all. In fact, she bloomed. She was looking much beautiful yeah. but then we also realized that she was on a drug called prednisolone right and uh, yeah so the prednisolone is tipped with another drug uh, which is normally used to help uh, with ulceration as in ulcers in the stomach I've, I've, I've forgotten the name of that particular drug and one of the side effects of that drug is to let you gain weight and also it helps you to build the blood uh, that has uh, that 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 is going down, mm. but so so I suspect from hindsight that aside the miracle that we had, that drug which was a daily dose that she was on was also playing a role in the kind of uh, personality that she 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 developed within the period that we saw an improvement. Okay. But what was surprising. To us is that the prednisolone is not necessarily to deal with the the, the platelet de defect because you see the platelet defect is is being caused by a certain kind of uh, inf uh, if you like a compromise in the blood maybe an infection or something which is causing the uh, the the platelets not work as it was supposed to work. So let's say that your blood is low and you are on prednisolone. Chances are that it will rise again. But when there is an infection in the bone marrows, the prednisolone is not going to counter the infections. But when we did the test, which is the bone marrow test, and then the trifan biopsy, those tests were supposed to reveal whether there was an infection which is leading to the problems in the pl platelets. But the test came out as saying that there was no problems. There was no problem. So the doctor was very confident that if there is no virus that is destroying or there's no bacteria or whatever it is that causes bone marrow deterioration, mm. if there's nothing like that that is causing that, then all you need is to be on good uh, food as in diet okay. and then be on your medications take good rest and then take good care of yourself and then you are going to regain all that you have lost by way of the blood so that was the the and this period was we definitely were. this period was very encouraging to you because you knew that well the worst is not happening yet take me to the time when things started to get bad <laughs> Uh -huh. So when when so the doctor said that when we go to when she goes to school, luckily there is one of the most uh, competent consultants in the country who consults for the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital. So it will be good that for about a month she goes for review. It was that particular review mm -hmm. that we discovered that the blood is coming down again, and when we realized that the blood had come down again it had come down to alarming rates as in emergency so she needs she needs more transfusions again and there yeah, one of the challenges about this particular condition is getting the blood and this was happening around the COVID 19 period and so how so were you getting blood were you buying it or were you family and friends did you get any support from friends and family this is a very very volatile area you know i mean so I, let's say i know i know you you are my friend but it's another thing when i say come and give me your blood hmm. uh, it, it, 
it, it raises a lot of questions for you because you don't understand transfusion. You are thinking that you will be infected. You are also thinking that um, I'm going to do something with the blood. You don't believe that probably what I'm saying is even true at all because you've never find me in that situation. So people had good excuses. So I had to volunteer my blood. But the thing is that if you give your blood, um, you can't give it again until after some three months uh, after being tested before you can give it. Unfortunately, the group, the, the blood group of my wife was one of the rare ones, B oh. negative. So though I had O positive, gave it out, it was just to replace, if they get the B negative, then they replace it. So the blood technically is not for sale. You bring blood and then you get blood oh, to wow. replace what you are taking. But the cost component is that the blood that is being you are going to take, it cannot just be taken from you and then released to the patient. It must go through uh, processes of, uh, they have to process that blood. Mm. And the cost of processing it as of the time was almost 100 Ghana cities. And, uh, so, 200 Ghana cities. and so this period, was she an admission at the Cape Coast Hospital? Was she in any form of pain? Yes, pain, pain was one of the most consistent symptom we dealt with from the very beginning, especially at the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital till she finally passed on. Now, pain is one of the major symptoms of uh, cancers or leukemia in particular. When your blood goes down, in anybody a typical example would be that you sleep and then you sleep on your your your, your arm or your leg and then you realize that it's become numbed so whenever your blood is low a part of the body struggles to move themselves so you are basically dragging them along so when we say you are tired it's basically that after a whole day's work the brain have drained so much from the head which is supposed and the heart area which is supposed to be the center and to pump the blood to the various area to other parts of the body where there cannot be a distribution to other parts and once that happens you are seriously in pain pain in the head uh what they call the uh I've forgotten the name for it, but you have pains in the head. And especially with leukemia, you have pains in the bones. bones. And then in the head, yes, bone pains, serious bone pains. Yeah. I can't I can overemphasize it. I can serious understand you. I totally understand. And, and by this time, where was Elijah? <laughs> so the point, so Elijah was then with my mother. You know, and then my mother was, she was, we had a home, a a, 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 my, my, my parents were working in Elmina, uh, so that is where my wife was living and mm. going to school. Okay. So what was happening was that Elijah was with them mm. in the same house. So what was happening is that Elijah had a special situation, the situation that uh, he reacts to the environment. I mean, he cannot tolerate death. So okay. whenever somebody is dealing with him and the person is not sensitive to the environment, his health gets uh, compromised. He starts having sinuses, cold, mm. and uh, most of them. So it became a problem for him to be with my parents, even though we were living in the same house. Mm. So the challenge was that I happened to be the only person who seems to understand his condition at the time okay. so i will leave them with my parents all right during the day and when i'm in the hospital but when i come back from the hospital i have to spend the day trying to feed him trying to bath him trying to even sometimes brush his teeth because then most of those things had been deferred in course of the day all because it was impossible for those who had the chance to do it to do it for him because when they did it it was like you are you are punishing him. He was not cooperating. It was not mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. So God was technically with my parents in terms of care. I was shuffling between my mother, my wife, and Elijah at the same time. My wife, especially in the day, and my son during the night when I had returned from the hospital. So, so that is 
between yes. between the time that you were coming to 37 and then you finally referred to the Cape Coast Hospital, at what point were you giving a diagnosis? And how did you eventually know that it is leukemia? And eventually, what type of leukemia were you told it was? Okay, so I must say that the consultant at Cape Coast, she's on top of her job. For her, when they did, they, they had to, do, they just set aside the previous labs and go, and, and they went back to another bone marrow test. Oh, they, they did a the new bone marrow, marrow aspirate and a trifling biopsy. Not a trifling biopsy. Just they, the aspirate. Just, they limited bone marrow aspirate, that's the word, yes. Okay. So the moment she did it, she did it at about by... 10 in the morning, it was done by 4 p.m. Professor Hakim was re reading the report. Interesting. Immediately, that it was acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. Mm. And for me, I had, I had practiced as a broadcast journalist uh, at a higher level. I will not say I'm an ignorant person, but it was very shocking to me that this all that we are dealing with this is cancer wow and then she, she says that you must be on chemotherapy immediately and um, again that was also a bigger shock a bigger shock because i have heard of chemotherapy but i didn't know what chemotherapy is what i knew of it is that people get bald especially the women they get dark instincts mm. they, it, it, those were the images in my mind, and I, I am just thinking, did what you, is all this? Yeah, did you, did you, after you received the news from the doctor, Ada, what did you call the doctor's name, the one at the Cape Coast Hospital? Professor Ivy Ajoa Hagen. Okay, after receiving the news from Professor Ajoa Hagen, did you tell, did you tell patients about this? It, it, the news the news was broken before us the two of us oh the two of you we okay. were broken, and for, we were in for, the uh, world. for for her she being a science student particularly a chemistry student how did she interpret it and how did she take the news you you can be a science student but when it comes to cancer can be, you know this uh, uh, undergraduate uh, uh, chemistry but cancer is not part of your 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 Nobody will go and read on cancer or on a, on, a, on a regular day. So it was new to her because her mother is alive. Her father is alive. They go to the farm. They are blasphemy. They, they are doing difficult works. They, they, they have old age in their family. And you can see her very beautiful. I mean, where from cancer? We asked the prof that what caused this? And she says that those who, they, they don't exactly know the cause but it is believed that when people work in an industrial setting let's say you are working at a barco let's say you are at, uh, you, you are within a set, uh, the mines you are doing galamse i mean those people who are really exposed to uh, industrial chemicals and things like that even that is not certain or people who are heavily on alcohol heavily on cigarettes mm. and, 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 and 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 those who are injecting things into themselves they can be considered to be prone even that is not conclusive and i look at my wife very unassuming very innocent like i told you she sit there with me in the classroom the in church. the church or we are eating our banco okay. so we were just surprised that they say we have this condition and they told us once they told us it is cancer they, the same moment they introduced chemotherapy then the same moment they said you must begin the next day so there was not even the presence of mind to consider what the cancer is mm. to consider what the chemotherapy is and to even mobilize ourselves to raise the needed money and in fact i thought that okay yeah so you have cancer you must begin treatment so go and buy then see this medication, buy this, buy this, and then uh, life goes on. And for the first time, you are said that the whole of Cape Coast, you can't get this medication to buy. And so you have and to become into Accra? The, you have to get it in Accra. So special arrangement. And even in Accra, there's only one pharmacy, Rock Pharmacy. That is uh, the, 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 the company that brings it, and everybody must get to them uh, uh, for it. And once you even get the medication, it must be 
protected under a certain condition from Accra to Cape Coast, it must be as if it is in the freezer or it is must it must be in the fridge. So and for a pray, for for a praying family like you and uh, how much effort you had put into this, did you? What were your expectations? Did you think she could make it? And how was her that family? How was her family taking the news? Okay, so there was serious collaboration from both families. The mother, for example, at a point had to leave her work. She was a teacher and also adding farming to it. She had to leave her work, come and be with us. Uh, for a period of one vacation, she was be with her. And you know, our hospital setting, you don't visit a patient and then you leave. You visit and you stay there because you are going to run the errands that the nurses and the doctors will require to continue uh, the, 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 the treatment. Uh, the, the question again, please. So I'm asking that between the time that you were coming to Accra, getting these drugs, and the fact that you're a praying family, you believed in so much miracle because at least you had seen some from the beginning of this illness. Did you think that she would survive it? Now hearing the name cancer, did you think she'd make it? Yes, I thought she was going to make it. And I was prepared to put everything on the line for that. And we did, we did all that. In fact, it was much after her death that I realized that I was not properly prepared. Right. Because it does appear to me that those who were managing the condition, uh, I'm not making assumptions for them, but it does appear from history, from the other people they've treated and everything, uh, they had a part in their mind that knew that it is possible she wasn't going to make it. They knew and this? My which of the hospitals? My which of the hospitals? Which of the hospitals did you think? The Cape Coast or were they, were you ever referred from Cape Coast? Yes, we, we, we spent three, we, so the up and down at uh, 37 was about three months, up and down in Cape Coast was about three months, and then up and down in Kolebu was three months. Wow. So nine months. months in all. Okay. And then in Kolebu, at what point and why were you referred to Kolebu? Okay, so the, the thing is that Kolebu is the main center in terms of the blood, in terms of the platelets, and, and that's also my home. I mean, that's where I am based. So in okay. terms of contact, in terms of friends, it, it was very easier to link up with other things that help uh, in the treatment. Right. And so we were referred, in fact, I requested for the referral. I requested for the referral mainly because of this. One, in course of the treatment, there was complication. The complication was that um, she had developed a strange kind of ulcer. And so because of this ulcer, she was not able to eat. Any food that touches her stomach, she must throw up. And even worse, anything that touches her stomach, she must wail in pain, as if you've drawn a brick on her leg. Hmm. She, could not, she, she could not sleep, she could not eat, and then she was constantly crying. And the doctors had exceeded their pain management doses. So for example, they were dealing with morphine. Mm -hmm. And then the morphine, you had 10 milligram uh, in a bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, she was doing about 40 milligrams in a day and wow. I was not able to, to do anything for her. Wow. And so the doctors were scared. So she had gotten addicted to the morphine, and then without the morphine, she cannot do anything. So it got to a point that the doctor who was dealing with us was frustrated. Now, mind you, Professor Hakim is only the consultant. She was um, the, 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 the director of medical school at the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital. She, she only comes there to just speak to the doctor on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, in this Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, there was only one person, one woman, a nursing woman, who was the medical officer, not an oncologist or a, a, a specialist, one medical officer who probably was trying to do her house, of, house service or something to become uh, something in cancer, mm -hmm. but she was not there she was the only person managing, as I witnessed it at the time, every case of cancer in the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, which was the major referral center for all the communities in the central region. Mm -hmm. So she would deal with the 
patients on admission and then go back to sit in consult uh, 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 to sit uh, in consultancy for all the patients who are coming on OPD basis. So when my wife's case became such that you cannot just stand on her situation, give her medication and move on to the next patient. And then it became like she needs attention consistently for a very long time. We saw signs of frustration. And yeah. then we also saw signs of a lack of uh, adequate care. And rightly so, as I've given you the background. And it was creating some level of animosity. I mean, the relationship was getting mad. Yeah. And again, I don't blame. I don't blame the doctor because we were focused on one person, but she was focused on several others who also needed that important care at the time. And this frustrated you, know, you and then you, 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 you took a transfer to Kalibu. I mean, Kalibu is quite flooded with a lot of cancer cases. How was the experience in Kalibu as well? In fact, I was not only... Uh, I, I didn't take her out for out of frustration. I think from the very beginning, the doctor gave me the hints, but I didn't pick the clue. You see, she told me that uh, since you are in Accra, why don't we refer you there? Mm. And I kept saying, we've heard so much about Professor Hakim, so we we'll let us be here, let us be here. But I think she was communicating in a language I should have picked earlier. So when I realized that we and herself have all been overwhelmed with what we are dealing with, uh, I then conceded to the previous advice and then put in the referral. So uh, it was not exactly frustration taking me out, but we all came to a point where we realized that we have exhausted everything there because uh, the cancer, uh, the, the ulcer in the stomach required a professional called gastroenterologist, but they didn't have it in Cape Coast. And we, all of those people were in uh, Kolebu. So when we finally got to uh, Kolebu, just to get you to where you, you asked, when we finally got to Kolebu, one thing I've also realized about our medical setup is that they will not accept their referral and just continue on the strength of the referral. Absolutely. I was they, going to they, go that. So the gastroenterological clinic in Kolebu would have to book you and give you an appointment date. And so uh, for, for so, such an urgent care, how did you work around that? We did not. In fact, they did not. They, they, according to uh, the, 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 the center in Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, they cannot refer us to an enterologist. They will rather have to refer us to the cancer unit or the hematology unit in Kolebu for them to examine the situation again and make their own decision if we require the enterologist. Okay. So, that, so when we came back to Kolebu, Again, they treated us as if we had just come to oh, hospital. Boy. They okay. did not just take the word of Cape Coast that we've been on this treatment three months at 37, three months there, and they must continue from there. Because then we had our third phase of chemotherapy to go to, which was the intensification stage. But they did not just continue on the strength. So we repeated the bone marrow test. So the good news is that when we repeated the bone marrow test, we realized that the disease had come to a remission stage of 3% from an original state of 100%, which meant that for all that we went through in Cape Coast, the pain, the disappointment and everything, something good was happening. Okay. Probably the, the medication, probably our prayers or both, that she had come to remission. And we were supposed to have continued immediately to the next stage. So the 3% the meant that the cancer had reduced to just 3% from 100% stage. And so did you see physically change? If not for the, uh, the other aspirate that she did in Kalibu again, did you see physically that she was changing? Was the pain reducing? There was no physical change. There was no physical change. What they are dealing with is uh, what they call whatever substance is in the blood that is destroying it. So for them, they are giving you medication which is naturally attacking both good cells and bad cells because mm -hmm. the entire cell system is contaminated. So it takes time for you to build cells that are healthy. So it wasn't going to happen within that short situation. And even especially in our case, because she was not eating due to the other situation I have, I, 
I pointed out earlier. So based on these situations, physically, we didn't see much improvement. But in terms of the reduction of the loads of whatever was causing the platelets or attacking the blood cell, it had reduced from 100% to three percent which was a major improvement mm -hmm. but this is what can you hear me yes yes this is where the major problem is we should have just gone ahead with the intensification but when you say you should deep. have when you say you should have just gone on with the next stage was it your call or it was the call of the medical uh, personnel at Kualibu? whose call is it or whose call was so it this Okay, so we had been put on a program at the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, and it's it's about the same regime. The chemotherapy has a regime. So on a certain date to a certain period, you must fi finish first stage. Then there's a certain period for a certain uh, period to get to the second stage. So we had done the first stage. We had done the second stage. So the doctor needed to review us and declare that we are due for the test stage. Mm. So according to the medical decision in the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, we were due for the test stage. But because of the protocol in Refera, the, 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 Cape, the Kolebu, Kolebu was not going to continue with the referral uh, with the treatment based on what Cape Coast is saying. Mm. They want to find it, find it out for themselves. And that is why we needed to spend an extra week doing the investigation to determine if indeed there is cancer and the state that that cancer had got into. And that took us one extra week. So when they finally determined that we were on remission, they felt confident that we need to continue from the test stage as the report from Cape, Cape Coast had indicated. But it was at that point that they discharged us to go home and prepare, come for a review. So there's a review of an extra one week. So that also led us into another delay of two more weeks. So with that two more weeks, they now told us that we should prepare for the drugs involved in the third stage. And at that point, a phase you needed about 10,000 Ghana cities to get drugs. They're so by this drugs. time that by this and time that you have been busy going back and forth with your wife from the hospital and did you take time off work and how were you raising the funds? I mean, looking at how difficult it was for you to even get blood from family and friends, how are you raising the funds? Okay, so back to the issue of work. Mm. So whilst we were at Cape Coast, I think on the second of January twenty twenty, on the second of uh, I think January 2020, yes. I was preparing to visit her at hospital when I got a call from the HR that, Benjamin, how is your wife doing? We hope everything is fine with her. I said, yes. And then the next news is that we don't have good news for you. The company has decided to move on without you. And I said, sir, what do you mean? Um, there's a, a clause in your appointment letter that says that both parties can mutually terminate. The company has exercised that uh, part of the clause. And I said, oh, did I do something wrong? He said, no, you didn't do anything. I said, so sir, since I started working, I've not even gotten a query before. So at least I... He said, no, no, no. If you had done something wrong, we would have put you on a performance appraisal uh, notice. But you've done nothing wrong. But this is the decision that the company had taken. We are grateful for your service. Pass by for the, to the office for a few things that need to be trashed out on paper. And then if company properties are with you, let's deal with that. So that's how the, the employment situation ended. Just like that. Was it the fact that you were not having time to go to work? Or what do you think it of course? Well, any time I was away from work, mm. I took leave and I was at every point absent on my official leave. What was happening is that there was a point I was running the night shift. So I would come to work the entire period of 20, 2020 Christmas. Uh, I was the sole person managing the company's uh, night session on the department that I was on. I will finish the night from 9 p.m., close at 6 p.m., and then take the next car to Cape Coast. And I will be on duty throughout with my wife, checking on my son, and then return back to Accra before the night schedule is due at 9 p.m. I did it consistently for the period I was on, and then I had to take a break because it was Christmas uh, schedule. 
and I had done my schedule and then the next team. So the, a second day into my rest, I had the score. Okay. And so um, at what point really did st things start to get really bad? Back to Kolebu. At what point did, did things start to deteriorate? The point that things got very bad is where I am taking you to that the first, the first, the first week, uh, we, we when we got to Kolebu, the doctors had told us from Kepo that we were, we were due to call it, uh, to continue, but because of the procedure matters, we delayed one week, and then there was an extra week for us to come for review. By good time, we were told the drugs to get, and then there was one more week to prepare and get those drugs, because like I said, these are not over-the-counter drugs, and mm. they must be properly arranged. And the first goal, we had to pay about 10,000 Ghana CDs just to get the drugs. And the protocol at Kolebu was unlike Kepo's. If all the drugs you need for the period of the ther therapy is not ready, they won't begin. So we had to get all of them. So by the time we began, the proper uh, treatment and the doctors were ready to continue, they noticed that she was deteriorating again. So they needed to find out if indeed the remission they said was 3% was still at that same 3%. And when they did their examination, they mm. realized that it has shifted from 3% back to 100 percent and this is what they call relapse so that mm. meant that we have to begin from ground zero all that we have done the therapies that we had done we had to begin again the medication the process we are done from 37 to cape coast we have we have to begin all over again what and was the reaction of we, the hospital what was what was the reaction of the uh, medical person taking care of her when they saw that she had entered a relapse stage I will just tell you how it happened. So one day I was there and then, you know, when they are coming for their rounds, they call something rounds. So when they are coming for their rounds, when they visit the patients, I was there one day going to visit my wife. When one young doctor met me and they said, uh, your wife's situation has relapsed, so we have to start the treatment again. So go to the, 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 the consulting room, they will give you the drugs to, to get. And I was like, Sir, are you serious? He said, we are busy now, so we will talk again. I was struck. So I, 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 I just didn't understand even what he had just said, because it is now that I have the benefit of hindsight to understand what relapse meant and the full implications of it. But when he said it at the time, that go and buy the drugs again, I was just, because I had bought 10,000 worth of drugs sitting by her bedside. And you are saying, say, I should go and I, I didn't know what to do with the 10,000 worth of drugs anyway. And you are telling me to go and buy a different, another kind of, it didn't make sense. So there was one female doctor who later realized that, you know, the way the colleague had gone about it was wrong. So she approached me and said that the next day when they come for the award rounds, she will make room for me to meet one senior doctor. And then if I have questions, I can ask that doctor. So I met the I, I met the doctor as the the nurse had the, 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 the junior doctor has scheduled, not the same person who broke the news. And then he sat down, one doctor, I think Kwakume, she sat he sat down and said, Sir, what's what do you, I hear you have questions? <laughs> and I didn't know where to begin from. I said, I don't have questions. Uh, I have been told that we are beginning the process again. And he said, Yes. And then I told the, I, I was quiet for a while and I said, okay, so when we begin again, is that guaranteed that she's going to get by? I said, there are no guarantees. This is medicine. God is the only one who heals. We are just uh, doing our job. And he said, any more questions? And I said, thank you. And I went back and then I went to do as I have been told, but the next The long and short is that I think when they began the next process, it didn't take long, then she, she died. Where were you when the inevitable happened? I was with her. I had gone there. If you read the last chapter of my book called Final Moments, I had gone there and then I wish we don't talk about this one. Uh, right. <laughs> I would rather wish we And how was Elijah? Chapter. How was your son? So we had come to Accra with him, and then I'd gotten a young lady who sat in for me when I'm in the hospital. So she was managing the home whilst I was away. And 
but so the morning that she finally passed on in my arms, I had to, for the first time, call a brother that I beg. I, I need strength, and, you know, he should come and help me. But I didn't tell him what had happened. But so I was with the cops until this, my brother came, and then we had to do last minute things. The most even frustrating is that whilst I was mourning, the nurses were attacking me for, they said they gave her a certain drug to resuscitate her. So uh, this is the price I should pay for it. And that was like, I think five cities or 10 cities. And I like, hey, so can't you just wait for me to at least catch out these five cities? And, you know, so all of this listens to a number of things that I feel that even as we talk about cancer day, the challenge is not just about the cancer, it is also about the context and the environment within which we manage cancer. Because if you take the cost component, mm -hmm. which is very heavy on a, a middle income person like myself, which I felt I was very privileged, uh, given my salary and all of that, um, cancer has specialist engagement. You cannot get anybody at all, even if you have all the money in the world to help you deal with the condition. And that is what is lacking in our hospitals. It is, it is, it is not okay to have just one woman, as of the time I was there, handle these cases. Even if everything is in place, she will be overwhelmed and the patients will pass on. So there are things immediately we cannot deal with as a country, but there are some of them we can deal with. Can we look at how we train medical personnel. Benjamin, hold your thoughts on that, and uh, I definitely will come back to that to take your recommendations and what you think we can do as a country to improve uh, this particular situation in our hospitals. I know that it's quite Very an well. emotional one for you, but just hang in there for a minute. I'd like to invite our viewers into this conversation. In the meantime, so uh, between today and tomorrow, we've got these vouchers for you. Um, we say that early detection is also helpful, and so all you have to do is call us on all of our shows. Um, so today is World Cancer Awareness Day, and we're here. We at the Multimedia Group are excited to make available 125 mammogram vouchers for our female audiences from the age 40 and beyond. Uh, whilst I'm, I'm telling you how to get a a voucher for yourself or for your fa your mother, your sister, or your wife. You can call us. You've heard the story of uh, Benjamin's wife um, dying many times, and have you also experienced? Have you seen it before? What can you say about it? Join us on zero three zero two two one one six nine three or four, or send us a message on our socials, and uh, you can hashtag us Prime Morning on Twitter, Joy Prime TV, and on Facebook. Joy Prime TV. You can also send us a WhatsApp message on 0551-575757. 0551-575757. Have you seen somebody who's been diagnosed of cancer before? Have you experienced it before? The harrowing experience. Share it with us. And so I would like you to have a mammogram to ensure that your breasts are very healthy and also cancer free. Now, these vouchers will be giving away on the 4th today. If you call, maybe I just would give you a voucher. Uh, 4th and 5th February across all of our platforms Joy FM, Joy News, Hits FM, Joy Prime, Adum FM, Adum TV, and Asempa FM. Please note that each voucher you receive has a scan code and uh, the voucher has uh, security details. The voucher must be submitted by the patient physically in order to get the mammogram done only at the International Maritime Hospital. International Maritime Hospital. Hospital. The voucher expires on the 30th of April 2022. Now, this initiative is supported by Roche Product Limited. Remember, mammograms are recommended for patients aged 40 and above. What? Please do not call the WhatsApp message. What do you have to say? What are some of the experiences in the hospital? I have my own fair share of uh, experience and wouldn't want to even bother you this morning. But um, let's go to Bema Camp and talk to... Um, hello? Is it Shade or Shay? Faith from Bema. Oh, Faith. Hi, yeah. Faith. Faith. Good morning, Faith. Good morning. I'm from Adovagwe. Oh, Merkudovagwe. Uh, 
Faith, and so uh, so Faith, Faith has just been uh, telling us how she feels about the story, and uh, it says that when patients go to the hospital, it's only ideal that. Uh, especially referral centers, they should continue before they do other investigations. For this part of it, we may have to talk to uh, referral hospitals and ask if that's a normal procedure. I won't be able to tell. But let's go back to Amina. Uh, let's go to Tama and talk to Amina. Hi, Amina. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Amina. Thank you for calling. Thank you also. Actually, the gentleman, I'm very, very, very sad, but he has really tried. He has really tried. May the Almighty Allah bless him. And all that I want to tell him is that he should keep heart and then pray to the Almighty God so that God will bless their son. And then he should have faith in God that whatever Allah gives you and he takes back that may he love that fellow more than you. That is why he's taking back the wife. So may Allah have mercy on the soul of the wife too. And then may he also get a good job in future in order to take care of the son. God bless him. Thank you, Amina. I'm sure that Benjamin Heji. You can share with us your thoughts. 0302 or 4 I've got another caller on the line. Hi. So another Amina, but this time around from Abeka. Hi, Amina. No. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Christy from Abeka. Oh, right. Christy. Thank you. Yeah. Please go on. Um, please, can I get one of your... Um, I'm, I'm about 40 years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, Christy. So uh, please hold on and then my producers will take your uh, details and then let you know how you can get a voucher for yourself. Okay. okay. It's very impressive you very that you're taking the initiative to get a mammogram done. Okay. Okay. All right. So 0302 211 or 94. Let me see I've, if I have some messages from you. But Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Benjamin, how has life been? <laughs> God has been very good. Okay. God has been very good. Yeah. I, I see you wouldn't want to talk much about after. No, no, no. I, I, I have my second book out. Okay. And uh, the second book talks, the title of the book is Starting All Over Again. So, if you get that book, it gives you details about what I did after her demise. Okay. So that is also detailed discussed in the book. And this is where I will encourage all of us to review our terminology of the word cancer victims. Normally, when we talk about cancer victims, as I've come to hear it in the media and elsewhere, they are referring to the patient lying on the bed. Mm. But cancer victims include their children, it includes their spouses, it includes their relatives, it includes everybody who is affected because somebody important to them is having this condition because if you are not the one sick you may be the one to cough up the money mm. you may have to look for a job at a point if you have a child and that child is being raised by this mother who is sick let's say as a single mother who happens to get cancer and the mother passes on and this child doesn't get anybody to continue from where the mother left off this child is a victim of cancer his education and future is in the balance so we need to broaden the terminology of victims of cancer to include 
all those who suffer as a result of one person or the other who has been affected directly by the disease. I'll take a few of your messages. Um, so this is from Leticia. Leticia says that my child suffered cancer and it was just terrible for me. Uh, well, she's dead and uh, because nothing I did saved her. I wish the government comes in treatment for cancer. It's just too expensive treating cancer. I sympathize with the man because I was a victim as well. Good morning. Once again, this is coming from Leticia. Leticia has actually confirmed what uh, Benjamin says, that the victim is not just the person on the bed, but also people and family around who indirectly also uh, suffer from the effects of it. We've got another caller. Hi, Salasi. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Salasi. You're calling us from Nkoko. Yes, please. Okay, thank you so much. Go on. Okay, I am also a victim, actually, but it was my dad. And mm. honestly... If you go to Kolebu and you are being told you have cancer, it's like you dealing with death face to face. A year, yeah, papa. Especially, so we fear cra na we niye busi ni biya wakra. Na yare fe o se fa o yare fo ko Kolebu. I became very wretched. Even food to eat, where to take your bath. Now, doctors. Yeah, yeah, it really hurts. Say, mm. after you have been referred there, no, then they are going to start everything all over again, forgetting about the cost, whether you can be able to afford it or not. In fact, we should all pray that cancer gets away from this world. Yeah, yeah, pa. But a bear papa say, said my brother, ne cano say, and come over to me. I your process in this anchor. Yeah, you're more referral pa. But on, on, on a more serious thing, I had to take my dad home knowing that he's going to die. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. You knew this or you were told, say, any ye? We were told, say, any ye. But as a time, I'm going to and say, any ye, no. Now we had nothing. We spent every penny that we had. Until when we were going home with our dad, even ye, ye, be declare, when ye, day. Now ye, see, can you not have son? And son, a doctor, back home was very bold enough to tell her, say, my sister, any year, mufa nunku fi nunku. And ye didn't bear fi nunku, it was hell. Can't say ye ya pa. Ye beti me fi ya si anke ye. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry to hear this. I'm so sorry. Um, good morning. I'm literally in tears after hearing his story. He really did well supporting his wife. May God bless and strengthen him. Um, so I've got a few other messages. But Benjamin... Um, tell me, what should friends and family, you know, what should friends and family do moving forward just to, to make things a little better? Okay, so if you, if you go to the recommendation part of my book, especially with family, let me, let me, let me start from family. Okay. The thing is that when you have cancer, what I, or when you, when you are sick in the uh, hospital setting, what happens is that, uh, okay, Benjamin, Yuri, Yuri, so somebody will just pass by one of the relatives who is not within the whether or not a son of benjamin or a daughter of benjamin had let's say a brother or a sister they just come in to come and visit and have a a fraternization moment with the patient mm. madam we came to visit you we hope you are fine yes that kind of help is completely inadequate for a cancer patient what is required is that the moment as some uh, if somebody gets cancer in your family the family as a larger unit i'm talking about the extended family should all regroup they should make a decision that the children of the victim the children of the one on the bed should all go to one particular family so let's say that if it is Elijah, Elijah should leave me and then be given to my brother who is married and has his home. And I wouldn't have to bother my head at all about Elijah. So that aspect is there. The family must decide that we have A, B, C, D people as members of the family, three of them. They are responsible to be in charge of, uh, uh, be like a liaison between the hospital and the patient because 
There are issues of medication. There's I there are issues of blood transfusion. There are also issues of uh, other processes like complications, mm. and that, and there are also issues of finances that must be that must be dealt with. If you don't have a special unit of the family solely dedicated for this who decide to do research, who decide to speak, who decide to contact, and decide that any time the doctors want to discuss medicine, not necessarily that the spouse is the one to be consulted, they must speak to this member of the family who maybe has some upper knowledge in medicine or health, so who can immediately understand the language of the doctors and then make help them make decisions quickly. It's going to really uh, be just what the doctors are saying to the layman who doesn't understand anything at all about the the, 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 the the processes. And when you do that, it's going to be full time for the relatives who have been assigned this job. Yeah. And then there should be another set whose job is to take care of the patient. My dear, I was bathing my wife. I was cooking her meals. I was washing her clothes. I was going to the market to get the food stuff for the next day. I was still taking care of. Couldn't it be that we have one person or two people whose job is to man the personality of the patient? If they limit, say, the husband because of intimacy reason, you should be solely responsible for your wife's physical contact and her bedside protocol. That is fine. Then the food must come from other people who are also within the family. So the okay. husband is not worrying about meals, worrying about market, worrying about washing. All he does is that he receives the food, feeds her, bath her, and then he too can get time to rest. Thank you. When my wife, Thank you. the major thing I dealt with was stress, a lot of stress. My body was tired. You could feel, I could, I can, I could sleep for two days and then I will not wake up. It, it, it was that terrible Thank because you. just one person dealing with all this of particular this. situation yeah where can we get the book quickly you can get some at epp books legon okay. epp any of the branches you can also call my line 244 825187 and then you get a delivery service 244 825187 and then you get a delivery service Thank you so much, Benjamin Achinabretio, for sharing your story with us. Thank you for your time. And once again, I'm so sorry for the loss. Pleasure is mine. Thank you for uh, joining us on BH BTH Today. I don't want to get emotional, but thank you so much for joining us on BTH Today. Today is 4th February, and as I said earlier, we dedicate 4th February to create a lot of awareness uh, for cancer, the many types of cancers. I mean, so much. It's not just limited to breast cancer. So much, if you read, you will get to know. And so take time, learn a thing or two so that we make it better for our cancer patients and even victims that get affected indirectly. Do stay, there's more on the show. Benj um, Jay, Jay comes on this day. I see.